Spirit Lake beneath beautiful Mount St. Helens looked like this in May 1980. Spirit Lake, June 1980. The devastated aftermath of the greatest volcanic eruption and natural disaster in American history. This had been a place of unrivaled beauty and tranquility. Now, it is a hellish landscape of devastation on an enormous scale. The wreckage of a massive eruption of Mount St. Helens equal to the energy of 27,000 atomic bombs. For 123 years, Mount St. Helens had remained dormant then, at 8.32 a.m. on Sunday, May 18, 1980, an earthquake initiated the greatest landslide in recorded history. Mount St. Helens erupted with an explosion heard 700 miles away. blasted into the sky. Gigantic clouds of ash towered 16 miles above the mountain. The summit 1,300 feet of Mount St. Helens was gone. avalanches of superheated gas and pyroclastics roared down the flanks of the mountain at hundreds of miles an hour, searing and flattening everything in their paths. Massive flows of debris flooded and filled the valleys of the Tootle, Kalama, and Cowlitz rivers. Prevailing winds carried the ash to the east, blanketing a vast area with a blinding ashen fallout. In eastern Washington, noon became night. This is Yakima, Washington emerging from the long ashen night. Roads and airports, schools and businesses are closed. Cars stall in the choking ash. Downtown Yakima is a deserted ghost town. There is but half an inch of ash here. Ritzville has five inches, Moses Lake too. Spokane, Ellensburg, Richland, all are covered with the same pervasive shifting ash, which extends now into Idaho and Montana. The eruption of Mount St. Helens captures the headlines of America and beyond. Its unfolding drama, like its ash clouds, circles the world. Even more indelible were the memories of those who witnessed the eruption. All who were there in the Northwest that day can still answer the question, where were you? 
in the mountain blue. People remained indoors or ventured out wearing crude respirators. The residents of eastern Washington began adjusting to the new gray world, emerging with a sense of humor dusty but intact. Nearer the devastated mountain, the story is a grimmer one. Within hours of the eruption, Army, Air Force, and National Guard units have initiated a massive search and rescue operation. They will lift 130 survivors to safety, but they will discover 25 killed, and more than 30 will remain missing and presume dead. The views from the first helicopters into the devastated area are of awesome destruction and upheaval. Fifteen miles from Mount St. Helens, trees have been scorched brown and killed by the heat blast. Nearer the volcano, no trees stand. The north and south forks of the Tootle River leading from the volcano lie buried beneath a huge debris flow from the collapsed northern face of the mountain in places more than 600 feet deep. Gone are the birds, the deer, the color green. Near Mount St. Helens, nature must start over. Through treacherous weather and visibility, the search and rescue operations went on. But with each hour, the chances for additional survivors ebbed. The death toll mounted, and this dangerous and unpredictable volcano prepared another surprise. In the middle of the night, one week after the first eruption, Mount St. Helens erupts again. This time, the ash falls to the west, the names of Kelso, Longview, Toledo, Cougar, Castle Rock, Kalama, Chehalis, even Portland, Oregon, are added to the list of affected cities. Interstate 5 between Portland and Seattle is shrouded in ash. Rains temporarily suppress the ash, but coat the roads with a slippery frosting of wet ash. When the roads dry, tires lift fresh clouds of obscuring ash. Visibility at places is cut to near zero. Driving becomes extremely hazardous. Volcanoes can be lethal in more ways than one. At the end of Memorial Day weekend, tens of thousands of vehicles clog Interstate 5, inching homeward through the dense volcanic gloom. From the air, ash-covered cities such as Longview and Kelso presented a wintry scene. In the Columbia River beyond, dredging operations have begun to clear the riverbed of mud flows which have paralyzed shipping. The great forests to the west of the volcano are covered with an ashy dust. The evergreen state is turning gray. Since the first eruption, Mount St. Helens has remained obscured by clouds. Only a towering column of steam above the cloud cover betrays its position and activity. Finally, weeks after the first eruption, the weather clears briefly. Authorized aircraft penetrate the blast zone of the restricted area to view another world. Two hundred and thirty square miles of timber flattened, combed by a gigantic force into grotesque patterns resembling coarse fur, revealing, like millions of frozen compass needles, the flow directions of the blast waves. Every treetop points away from Mount St. Helens. Looking westward from the northern base of the volcano, the headlands of the Tootle River are gone. 
buried beneath the massive landslide which began the eruption. Collapsed craters in the debris reveal where huge fragments of the mountain's glaciers were hurled, buried, and melted away. Spirit Lake is entombed 200 feet beneath this gigantic, steaming, log-filled mud hole, which has assumed its name. Three weeks after the first eruption, the clouds cleared from the flanks of Mount St. Helens. A towering plume of steam continued to boil thousands of feet into the sky from the volcano's active crater. A light coating of fresh snow softened the charred, tortured sides of the mountain. One could even say that Mount St. Helens was beautiful again. The crater of the decapitated mountain remained hidden beneath its steaming crown. Aircraft which ventured to its stormy edge viewed only a roiling cauldron of steam. The eastern flanks of the volcano now wore massive coats of ash. Etched into its sides are scars from which one can begin to reconstruct the cataclysm. Great channels carved into the deep ash and debris through which the mud flows poured into the valleys below. The collapse of the north flank of Mount St. Helens and the great lateral blast which followed created this unearthly landscape. The volume of the avalanche deposit is immense, enough to bury all of downtown Seattle to the height of the Space Needle. Superheated volcanic rubble was buried deep in the ash and debris. Spectacular fumaroles mark their violent exhaust of gas and steam. This chaotic, upheaved landscape was cast when the collapsing northern flank of the volcano crashed against the opposing mountains. The huge runoff of melted snow and glaciers carved these deep canyons through the debris. The mud and ash-laden floodwaters wreaked havoc through the river valleys, roads, bridges, logging camps, homes. In the days following the eruption, the smoldering volcano hid its crater beneath its steaming plume. The mountain was making its own weather. Then, finally, the weather breaks again, and we attempt to fly into the crater itself. Approaching the volcano on its shattered northern side, we encounter severe turbulence flowing from the crater. The turbulence mounts. The stench of sulfur grows but we gain one of the first full views of the active volcanic throat of Mount St. Helens. Several days later, the volcano beneath us will explode in a third eruption of atomic force. <laughs> 